All right, let's get started. Let's sit down. We'll go through a few announcements. We got a little to wrap up from, we'll go through one more example of the NVIC and interrupt priorities and we'll start timers today. We also have some other announcements to go through and logistics stuff, so homework four is due, not today. That's not wrong. It's scary, it's scary. scary. We can fix that now. All right, starting again. Homework is due on Monday. Uh, office hours is normal. Um, we're going to start going into the fun, the more exciting part of the course. We're going to start going to go into projects. So the course is roughly broken into three sections, where it's you know, basically the first exam was all intern, or all about the core and how the core communicates. The second, third is all about the peripherals and how the peripherals uh, let you do things inside and outside the ship. And then the last part is you get to apply all that to an open-ended project. Uh, and we'll have a team formation meeting on Friday. We'll go over these details in a second. But first, we'll go over the exam. Oh, you're all super excited, looking at distributions. Oh, yo, there's a big <laughs> <laughs> This is not. Is this correct? Yeah, I think it's correct. Um, that's about normal mean for, for this class. We do, we do push you guys hard on your exams. The whole course is curved. Um, I will release the grades as soon as class is over. There's one, there's one exam that uh, still needs to be graded. They had to have an alternate exam time, but otherwise, you know, you guys can have your grades. Um, I did, in office hours, I started recording who comes to office hours. I was just curious, okay? Um, I'm not obviously going to reveal any of your exam grades, but I want to see if there's any correlation to people who come to office hours if they do any better on exams. Now, that could reveal two things. Either, one, I'm a great teacher. I'm a great teacher, and I'm going to help all those people get better in office hours, or that only people who go to office hours care, you know, uh, are really invested in the course, and therefore they uh, are in, going to do better in exams anyways. So one of those two things could be true. Here's a distribution of these are people, instances of people and their approximate grades that have come to office hours any time, not just normal office hours, but other office hours. I think the average shows that there's no conclusion, uh, relationship between um, uh, necessarily office hours and uh, grades. Although, we could argue that they went from here to there. Who knows? Anyways, I encourage you all to come to office hours. I will teach you things. It'll, it'll be fun, I promise. <laughs> All right. Any questions before we go over the design problem? Any comments? Concerns? Yes? One week after I release them. Yep. After class. <laughs> See, if I do it now, then you'll just look at your grades, all, all, your exam all class. I, <laughs> It took me a while to figure all this out. I'm getting smart. <laughs> all right. So let's, let's quickly review the design problem, make sure everybody's on the same page. So it was basically this. This was the design problem, right? You have some external memory. You need to build some weird state machine here, and you had to take something out of the temperature peripheral and put it into that. Okay? That was the, the high level of the exam. Uh, yep. Let's see. Right, so here, I can actually show the exam results. So we'll also release the exam uh, re solutions after class. So you had a MAT32, and it was connected to some external thing, and you had some wiring to 
some mechanisms to connect it, right? And the trick was you got a shift register. Now Matt assured me that you had all learned shift registers in 270. You very much assured me that this was true. You don't remember, fantastic. So the idea here is that this thing, right, has some timing requirements. You, you will get this, I promise. I know, I can't see it right now. I, or I, I have my contacts. Well, I can't see it either. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, we got it wrong anyway, so I don't really need to. You, all, the people did very well on this part, I'll tell you. I mean, honestly. <laughs> I'm not people. Okay, so the big trick was this, is that you're gonna shift out things parallel, right? Or I mean, parallel to series. So you had to have a shift register. The timing diagram of this de demanded that uh, each bit of the address was going over one bit at a time. Each bit of the data was going one bit at a time. And so here you take address and then you shift the address over, right? Then there you can put, write data, read data in and out of that section, okay? What, what questions? I hear grumbling. It must be, yes. How are you going to tell this thing what address you should send data to, right? This thing, the memory address, the memory module, you put an address in and you say, put the data in this address. So you're just going to use, in this particular, the way I solved it, you guys can solve it other ways, I suppose, but I use the lowest seven bits to you to denote the, uh, or the lowest eight bits to denote the address at which the memory module should be storing data in. So does that make sense? Yes, whatever, we didn't explicitly define it uh, because it was not a requirement, but this thing would have, a, a, this peripheral would have a memory range associated with it, or an ad, or sorry, a address range. And so you send data into this address, and then that, a version of that address gets pushed over to here. Yes? Why is your address one flipped between read and write? Why is my address flipped between read and write? Like, so you have a controller that goes back to write. Yeah. So it will flip between either reading an address or writing an address in or reading something back. This is going to turn this thing on or off. It's either going to clock data out or not clock data out. Why is that pointing to control? Uh, oh, all right, maybe I got an error. I don't know. We were pretty liberal with how we grade things, I promise you. We had, it's basically as long as these inputs got over to here, and some of these things we're great in okay. Right? We, the, the amount of digital logic in here and inverters and flip-flops was amazing. Uh, and I just, I just looked at it and said, okay, you know, you're trying to get somewhere to point A to point B. It was basically, did you connect this thing to this thing and this thing to that thing? That was the, uh, the overall, or did it make sense whatever you were trying to do? All right. Then you had to write a function that was gonna take data from temperature and put it into memory. The trick here, the, the, the uh, evil uh, professor made the data from your 16-bit temperature not the same size as the 8-bit memory that you're supposed to in, put it into. You got 16 bits, you gotta go put it in 8 bits, so you have to go break it into two. Any way you wanted to, it didn't really matter. And then we got to the timing diagram. People did get this problem 100% right, but this was certainly a difficult, the most difficult part of the question. So uh, this is where it, we tie it all together, so I want to go over it. The idea here is if you're gonna read out of the timer, uh, or I mean a temperature sensor, that is, that is this. That's just an APB read. That's exactly this first part of the diagram. Right? You're gonna read out of a register. The trick was um, that the memory, the external memory, required wait states. Why does it require wait states? Depends if you're doing a, a read or a write, you're absolutely right. Because why does it take that? Because you had to shift it out and the um, time diagram demands how many clock cycles it takes for it to occur. So the whole idea here is if you, uh, go on here. Right, so the done state of this controls P ready saying when it's done. So if that device is demanding that you wait, that waiting time is reflected in your APP reads. So that's why there is supposed to be some amount of time here that you had to wait for that 
memory to get all the way in there. And so this is we're really trying to get you to connect. We're not trying to be overly evil, I promise. I know it might feel that way. But we're trying to make you connect the idea that these peripherals and how they interact have impacts all the way up the pipeline. So in this case, the way the peripheral operates impacts the data and what happens on the APB bus. And likewise, and you're connecting that all in your C code or your assembly code here. All right, any, you'll have chances to look through all of them, all the answers. Do you have any questions now? Yep. Writing a byte of data into the peripheral. Correct. I see why, I know why, I understand why it's taking long to write an address and then write the data. You have to, yeah, you, what you have to do is you have to, it's not that you write the address and write the data, you're writing both. Both take time to shift out. Your peripheral demands that there's some amount of time it takes to put out because of the timing diagram of how the memory module works. I understand that. I understand the, the look of mm, on your face. I got it. <laughs> it's okay. You can't just assume the peripheral runs at eight times the speed. No, you, uh, which clock does it run off of? That's true. That's a good point. Right? What clock does that run off? That runs off P clock. That's the same clock here. Yeah? Why wouldn't the memory instantly die? Why wouldn't the memory instantly die? Oh, be done? Spitting out all the, I thought we could read it in one cycle. The memory? No, not the, okay, the, tap, the, the memory out of the yep. temperature die. Uh, well, the, the timing diagram for the APP bus demands a certain timing. And so it needs one cycle to instantiate the data. Then P enable goes high. And then uh, you're able to read the data out. That's fine. <laughs> All right, so you guys, again, can come to office hours. If there's something you don't like, you can always do a regrade request. If we misinterpreted how you're doing it, that's fine. I'm sure somebody tried to bit bang the whole interface. Uh, bit banging means you, you manually control with each read and write how the GPIO line could go up. So you could write eight bytes eight transactions just to make that line go up and down in the right way. It would, wouldn't technically work, but it's okay. Uh, you still get some points for trying that out. All right, any more questions about the midterm? Okay, I, I'm sure there'll be more questions later. All right, uh, so let's go over, um, one more NVIC example, and then we'll go on to timers. Hello? There we go. All right, so how, did, how are these connected? It's important to remember that we're not going through the bus structure. The GPIO or whatever is gonna throw off a timer has a wire that goes back to the NVIC. In fact, all these peripherals probably have multiple wires, and there's, on your device, there's or 96 wires that go back to the interrupt uh, vector controller. I've gone through this diagram a bunch of times, but it's important just to remember. Your code is doing something. An external interrupt occurs, which changes the function or the, the processing of the core. And uh, then the NVIC will look up in the interrupt vector table. This wire that went high corresponds with what uh, interrupt, and therefore I need to go to some location in memory and start executing that code. And this table, holds that mapping. So each one of these addresses corresponds to a wire that the NVIC uh, is taking in, then it goes and looks up this address and changes the program counter to that address. Of course, it has to do some stacking. I guess it's not on this slide, but you have to do stacking. You have to retain the state of your uh, core uh, program so that when you come back to it, it's all there. And the, the main program has no real idea that Anything has happened. There's no, for, from its point of view, it's transparent. It's kind of like, you know, you wake up with amnesia and you're like, how long was I out for? And typically, you want to make your interrupts short. You don't want them to be 
thousands and thousands of cycles because now you'll have trouble making forward progress in your main program. Uh, the counter example is this. I've certainly written programs that are basically everything is done in an interrupt. And uh, my main is basically go to sleep and then while one. You're just in sleep mode in main. That's all you're really doing, trying to conserve power. So there's different ways to architect your code, but it's important to understand when you have too many, too much code in your interrupt and when that might be a, a problem getting forward execution in your overall program. All right. We talked a bunch about this. So when you do stacking, sorry, when you interrupt, um, come into an interrupt service routine, you know, the hardware is going to automatically uh, save the uh, program counter, program status registers, R0 through R3, R12, the link register. Um, you're gonna update this stack pointer to the new location, and then you're gonna start executing code. The core is gonna go and get the new PC from the uh, NVIC, or sorry, the NVIC's gonna get the new PC from the uh, interrupt vector table, and then you're gonna go in to execute. Um, the important part, kind of remember here, that we didn't talk about before, is this has cost 12 cycles. There is a delay inherently in getting into uh, an interrupt. Um, like, what you mentioned about putting main and I mean, there, there's different ways to architect your code. You, you have a lot of, I mean, if, you, if your only task is to set the LED on when somebody presses the button, your entire program now lives in your interrupt. So it just, it does depend on what you're trying to do. Uh, if you're only essentially reacting to external events, then you probably don't have a lot going on in main. Um, this 12 cycles, uh, if you're trying to measure things that are happening very fast, I had a project once where I had a, a, a protocol that I was trying to, to measure, uh, an RFID protocol, and basically I was getting edges in that represented you know, highs and lows that represented the timing between things, between bits, one or zero, and, um, and there was no peripheral module that would help me solve that problem. I had to essentially bit bang it. I had to measure each individual thing. The latency here could be a problem. It could be that I may not be able to respond to a fast coming pulse train fast enough to measure something or respond. So this provides the kind of an upper bounds on how fast you can respond to something. Now, when I was doing it, my little microcontroller was like 16 megahertz. Here you're working at 120 megahertz. So you got to order a magnitude that you're faster at responding to things than in that particular case. But it's something just to remember, there's, there is a finite amount of time it takes to respond to an interrupt that's not perfectly fast. Okay, so let's work through a different type of example here where we're looking at uh, interrupts. We'll look at, this is along the lines of tail chaining and late arrivals and all those sort of things. What do we do when we have concurrent interrupts? All right, so we're in a program. Uh, see, we have stack pointer pointing at some location. We have a bunch of enabled interrupts. Let's see, we have one enabled interrupt. Uh, it has its priority. Uh, nothing is active, nothing is pending. Uh, and we have our uh, memory context and memory address. Okay. So some interrupt occurs. Oops. What's going on? Uh, it's gone. We've changed from uh, non pending to pending. We're gonna start stacking. I don't know why that arrow points that way, that's exciting, but that's stacking. Uh, so here we're going to take the state of the core and basically put it up on the stack so that we can get back to where we were later. Now we're not gonna stack all the registers in the core because we're gonna assume that our interrupt uh, handler is ABI compliant and it's not going to, it's, uh, its responsibility is not to go and clobber R4 through R, 11 and all the rest of those, and R13 and the rest of those. Okay. All right, so now we've now we stacked, we go to the next stage. Uh, our interrupt has turned from pending to active. Now we're in our ISR, doing some tasks. Uh, we're going to branch out of that. Now remember, we're gonna to branch to the link register, and it's that special value of the link register. It's not uh, the actual next location in code, it's 
part where it tells the processor, hey, if you see this thing you're supposed to branch to, what you're really supposed to do is you're supposed to go and unstack. That's your job. So it's basically a special code that tells you that. So you're going to unstack, and then you're going to be back to your normal execution. Well, what happened? Wait a second. Did I miss a step? I'm going to unstack. I'm out of active. And now we're going to go back to normal program execution. OK, so that's the base condition. Yes, we'll try. Um, when we're doing our labs and stuff, well, when we're doing our own interrupts, we have to make sure that we're also we're ABI con uh, compliance. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Because if you go and change those other registers, uh, and you're, that wherever you are in main, expect that there be a value, then there would be a problem, right? Main won't execute correctly. Is there other questions? Okay. So let's go through some other examples. All right, so we're doing, this is nested interrupts. So here we're in the program. Uh, interrupt, uh, I think this is external interrupt three occurred. Maybe that's 13. Uh, going into ISR nine. Now, DMA, we haven't really talked about DMA. Uh, DMA is direct memory access. It's basically, I wouldn't call it a core, but it's a module that you can program uh, with the core. You, you set up registers and that sort of thing, but it will transfer memory from one location, or data from one location to another one for you. So you don't have to spend core cycles doing it. So if you have a task like take these ADC measurements and put them in memory, you don't, and it's a lot, say a thousand memory addresses, you don't want to spend all that time in your core doing that. Uh, so you can just program this thing to go and execute that for it when it's done or it hits the end of its, say, buffer size, it'll throw an interrupt and then you need to go and service that and say, hey, go do this next task. So DMA is not something we directly cover with a lab, although it's super useful. Usually there's one group a year that uh, uses it just because they have to, because they don't have enough processing power otherwise. Anyways, it's just, this is just a FYI, this thing exists. That's all I'm trying to teach you right now. All right, so where are we? We had one active already. Uh, we have one pending because we have DMA uh, channel two came off. If we look at the priority, uh, remember lower value uh, means uh, it's more urgent. And so we see that DMA uh, has a priority three and this one has priority five. So we're going to interrupt the interrupt now, you could go and stack, but you d should not. Oh, no, you do stack. Sorry, I was thinking about uh, a different case. So we're going to go stack. What are we going to stack? We're going to stack the state of the ISR9. That's going to go on to the stack. So now we're essentially two, inner, you know, we have two, uh, two core states on there. So you can imagine if you have a lot of interrupts, your um, stack is going to start filling up with all the state information. All right, and then you're gonna go, now here we're gonna go through, we have two active, we're in this ISR, so now we have two active, okay? Um, and so how does it know, if you had multiple interrupts, how would it know what to go back to? Yeah. When you see the Exactly. So you have a record here of everything that's happened, and you just have to unfurl this record, uh, putting it back in the core, and that's your kind of your path home, or that's the record of all the stacks. The thing, the part that comes up later on is if you have um, uh, things of lower priority but equal or sub priority, so equal or lower priority or sub priority priority that come in late. So you have these late arrivals, and that might be the case where you don't unstack; you go to do something else. I think we have an example of that. All right, so now we get to the end of this. We unstack. Um, we've changed, so we unstacked here. We've changed this one from active to inactive. And then we're going to go uh, return back to our uh, original ISR. That's still active. We, when we get done with it, we unstack, and then we uh, turn that to inactive. All right, here's the uh, tail chaining example. I don't have a fancy animation for this one, but this is the case where, say, interrupt uh, 14 there occurs, and that equal either has this uh, same or lower preemption priority, which means it is not allowed to preempt S, uh, IRS 9 or ISR 9, um, but at the end of it, it's still in the pending register. 
So the NVIC's gonna look at it, say, what's in the pending register? Instead of unstacking or, or restacking it, because it would just, would there be nothing, or if you unstack and restack, that would be a waste of time. They basically don't do anything. They take a couple cycles here, and then it's called tail chaining, and then you just go straight to executing the pending ISR. Because its its state was all, its state is here. Whatever it was doing, and then it just goes. Now it's that went back on the core, and it starts executing ISR nine. It doesn't know it was interrupted. Uh, what, what would happen like if the stacking uh, procedure is interrupted? Like uh, the, only the PC was stacked, but the link register. It does not allow that. Uh, the, the stacking process is immutable. So even if you come in late, so we have this idea of late arrivals, which is if you, even if an interrupt comes in while you're stacking, it's still complete stacking, and then they'll switch to that new interrupt if it's of more importance. But yeah, that would, that would cause, you know, you'd have chaos, right, because you'd have all this mixed up data. That's in the, that's the PC, right? So that, oops, uh, no, no, sorry. So that's gonna be held right here. So that's where you are. So your entire state should be represented by those values there. Yes, I suppose in the, I guess you can only interrupt all the interrupts that are interruptible. All right, so if you have 96 interrupts, you couldn't get 97 because there's no way to, that that would happen, that you would interrupt something that was already on the stack. Uh, the priority and separate priority should take care of that. Yeah. The hardware architectures, architects decided that that was the thing to do. I'm not exactly sure what the, there's no like, uh, process that I'm, like this, no inherent process is happening there, it's just a hardware thing. Yeah. Is that common in like any hardware that has this concept or is it just, this is a general concept, right? This isn't specific? Yes, this is a general concept, although we're talking about how ARM does it. So the idea of interrupting to interrupt, that happens all the time. The details of how tail chaining is taken care of and do all of them, all processors, you know, take exactly six cycles or whatever it is here? I don't know. I don't know. Like it would, if you're unwilling to pay, if you don't want the extra hardware costs, you could just unstack and then restack. And it would take you all those extra cycles. Yeah. Any other questions? I will say there are processors, and I'm thinking about it, that take different amount of time to enter an interrupt depending if it's the first time or last time they've been called. So there's certainly differences across processors. All right, so any other questions about interrupts? This will be the, the last slides, last lecture on this. Uh, sure, let's see. Um, you have something on the external on the world that's occurring, uh, and you don't wanna have to keep polling for it, so that's like the base case. Somebody presses a button and you wanna respond to it. Um, another interrupt is you could have a peripheral that's doing some task, like we're gonna talk about timers, and you want, when the timer reaches a certain value, so a certain amount of time has passed, you want to, the core to react. You don't wanna keep polling that register to figure out what time it is, so the tor or will wake you up after a second and tell you to do something. Uh, what is another good one? Uh, you could have some, so DMA is a good one, but say you're trying to push data around somewhere. So say you have an SPI port or something. 
uh, and you've sent some data out and you're waiting for data to come back. You don't know when this thing is going to do that. This piece of hardware is going to do it. Uh, sorry, when SPI is zero peripheral interface. It's a type of protocol that chips talk to each other. So you've, you're waiting for some other chip to talk back to you. And when that data finally comes in, it will throw an interrupt and say, hey, pay attention to me and get your new data out of my registers. All right. Great. All right, so now we're jumping all over. Oh, wait. did I talk to you about this stuff? I just got excited about the exam. OK. <laughs> Um, so your project, de so uh, project details, they were released. I updated the links because I realized that they were last year's links. All the details the same. Um, to get us ready, to get us brainstorming and thinking about what cool projects you guys want to do, I'm going to ask that you create three ideation slides, which are basically just you. I'm forcing you to think about what you want to do. Okay, that's all this task is. Uh, is fairly lightweight. You have to have some image. It doesn't have to be fancy image like this one. Uh, some image on the thing, less than 100 words. I don't want to read a lot. Uh, and your name and your unique name. And if you're excited about this idea, you put a star on it. And then I'll go and when we do our team formation event, I'll at least have the ones with stars in a slide deck. And so you guys can pitch it. You're not required to pitch your project if you don't want to do that. But if things that you're excited about, let us know, OK? And so those you'll submit, there's a Google folder. You'll just submit your PowerPoint or your preferably Google Slides uh, to the folder. Just don't overwrite everybody else's stuff. It's, you know, be a good citizen. Uh, those are due Thursday, next week, and then, uh, then we'll have a team formation event. Um, well, I had to make sure you came some way, right? So. <laughs> I mean, I could make it an exam too, but then you know, that wouldn't. Nobody wants that. So, I'll serve pizza. This year, we're making it attendance required because last time uh, we always had problems with people who didn't show up and then didn't have partners and then didn't have any projects to work on. And it was all it was a miserable process for everybody. If you really can't make it, send me an email. We'll figure something out. But uh, Friday the tenth, we'll serve pizza. Basically, we'll have some. Um, We'll have uh, some of the IAs there. Matt will be there. I'll be there. You guys will give some pitches about projects you're excited about. We'll form teams. We'll groups of people to talk to, at least. Uh, you go talk to each other, figure out what projects you want to do. Okay? It's usually a fun time. Any questions? Four. Yeah? Five. Minimum is two. Optimal is three. We're gonna, you should look through the grading. Uh, a little bit. Uh, basically, the larger your team is, the more we expect from you. Right? No surprise there. And uh, you know, you will find that smaller teams, maybe their project isn't as whiz bang and exciting, but it's it can be a little easier. Some I won't say easier, but it's more straightforward to get points. You find that larger teams are like, what else do I have to do? What else do I have to do to make this thing uh, have enough points? And me and Matt will give you our recommendations for that since we've been grading this enough time. Again, much like many things in life, there is no like algorithmic thing we're going to say. If you write a thousand lines of code, you get an A in my class. Or if you just write these three things together, you get an A in my class. There is some judgment involved in this, and we will give you our best value judgment of this, this project that you're pitching hard enough uh, and you know, will get you the grade you're looking for. Or is at least put you in the category of grade you're looking for. All right. Um, then the Wednesday after the, the team formation event, uh, you'll have to register your team, which means go to a Google form, submit a team name, your teammates, one submission per team. I have to remember who you guys are. Like, you're going to have the glove team. I know we're going to have the glove group. Guarantee there's going to be gloves. You're going to have the Mario Kart group or something. I, I've done this a lot of times. No, no, not aquariums. No, no drinking games. I'm going to, there's a few things we just outlaw. I don't care about your drink, your, you know, your drink robot. Um, so as you get forward, there's a project description. It's updated for fall 23, even though it's the same thing. You guys will have to submit a proposal as a team, and then you have to come and have your proposal reviewed by me and Matt. Okay? And there'll be, I just haven't fig, finished uh, allocating this sign-up sheet, but it, it'll, it'll come soon. 
All right, any questions that you guys have? What have you guys heard about the 373 projects? <laughs> yep. Uh, I believe it's $100 per team, uh, plus whatever Matt has in his cabinets, which is basically, at this point, everything. Um, so, you know, you guys want microcontrollers or embedded, or like robot chassis, or a weird arm, or uh, XYZ plotter tables, or, well, see, so yeah, lots of wireless modules, right? So you shouldn't worry too much about what it is that you, like what hardware you need. Come to the proposal, have an idea, and we'll say, oh yeah, we, we have a bunch of that for you. Uh, I believe there's a list inside the project document of general things that we have in the lab. Yeah. All right, great. So today, again, we're going to talk about lecture, or timers. All right. Um, for those who would like uh, information beyond what the, the ramblings of this professor, there are places to get that. So um, if you look in the embedded Cortex manual, there's a bunch on, uh, on timers, uh, your application reference manual, some good YouTube videos. STM has produced a whole bunch of YouTube videos. They don't exactly supplant me. Uh, but they're still pretty good. They're, they're fancier videos than I can make. All right, so background on timer. So maybe we'll have a little philosophy time. We'll think about uh, what do timers do? What do we use them for? So in your daily life, right, you, you'll want to understand what the world clock is, world time is. You're going to set alarms, stopwatches. You're going to time things. So these are the functions that you as humans use for clocks. Uh, in the embedded systems land, we typically are doing things like using time uh, either to, we're either, in this world, we're measuring the passage of time. So these are all ways to measure the passage of time. We also use time, in a sense, to control external things. So control the brightness of LEDs, you will send out pulse width modulation, which is basically, we'll cover this, but basically it's um, uh, pulses of high and negative, or high and positive, Positive and low, I don't know. Uh, high and low, and the amount of time that you're spending high is how bright the thing will be. So in here, we're able to encode essentially what we would consider an analog value, brightness, in terms of something that computers are really good at. And computers are really good at measuring time. They suck at analog. We have to do all these hoops to try and turn analog signals into digital signals and digital signals into analog, but computers are really good at measuring time. So we have LEDs, you have motors, and, or servos, and separate motors, and DC motors. All of these things are controlled with time. Um, so we talked a little bit about timing functions on the computer. Um, provides accurate, accurate loops, generates pulses, uh, interrupts for CPU cycles, measuring the duration of time. Uh, even measures things in user space, right? So date, year, uh, day, year, month, those sorts of things. So I guess my question to you is, how do computers measure time? Like as humans, we took us a while to figure out how to do this. So first we had the sun. We used the natural world around us. We have to measure a physical thing. So just saying a computer uses a clock is not sufficient, right? Where does the clock get the idea of time? So take 30 seconds. Where, what is the physical process, physical mechanism where computers get an idea of time? Okay, I'm going to go to the 
All right, what do you guys think? How are these computers measuring the passage of time? How the heck does that work? Magic, okay, that's fine. It's getting pretty close, yeah. Any other ideas? Ooh. <laughs> One clock cycle per uh, night and day. I like that. that. That would be another way to measure it. That's exactly good. OK, and I was teasing somebody over here when I, they said, oh, how am I supposed to know this as a computer engineer? He was right. You don't actually have to be the type of person who designs a crystal oscillator that is an EE, but you at least have to know where these signals come from. Because if you know it, then you're going to figure out when you make a PCB or make a design later on, how is it going to be messed with? What are the error conditions of these things? So your intuitions and understanding the crystal oscillators are correct. That's generally how we do it. Um, I think we have a slide on it later. But basically, you have something, you pluck it with some electricity, and it physically vibrates, causing another electric signal to come back and that oscillates basically put it in negative feedback and it'll oscillate back and forth at some resonant frequency what's that frequency defined is the propagation of the acoustic wave through the medium that, that's occurring so and then you would tune that thing up so you have to have some piece of physics that's keeping track of time <laughs> okay um, and so your microcontroller uh, what it was your microcontroller is going to use these things. Uh, you're going to have these timer modules that we're going to go into today. And then your microcontroller can do things like wake up, like say, I want you to count up to some value and then wake up and then I'll execute some, some program. So you can use it for program flow control as well. So let's look at the anatomy of a timer. So at the lowest level here, we have external, you know, internal to your microcontroller, the hardware level, firmware, OS level. Okay. Oops. So at the lowest level, we have crystal oscillators, which is this mechanic. You can almost think of it like a mechanical filter. It will only oscillate at one narrow frequency. And you have to have some drive circuits. So basically, you have like an inverter that drives a one into here. Uh, a zero comes back out, and it will oscillate back and forth and back and forth. Uh, then you'll have some way to control that, because this is just one frequency, basically. And you'll have to, in this clock driver circuit takes it from this analog signal and turns it into a digital signal, and then you have to, you have the opportunity at least to change the frequency of that clock to some div, uh, multiple or division of the original signal. Uh, you can build counters on top of that to count how many clock edges have gone by. Uh, and we'll talk about compare and capture. These are different peripheral modules that will allow you to um, look at events like you have some external events and you're going to compare the time it took that event to occur compared to what was in a timer, for instance. Uh, then you get to the software level. You can have, uh, you know, basically your STM32 or cube ID land. You got some firmware up there uh, where you're able to ask, you know, uh, write values into registers, figure out the passage of time. And on top of that, you can make things like the iPhone watch where you have can set a user or you can set a timer that has an alarm that goes off of a certain time. Uh, or uh, you can keep track of world time. Uh, I guess this level is here. This is all a local reference frame. These crystals have no idea of Eastern Standard Time. They're just keeping track of how many clock cycles have gone past since the th device has booted up, or at least they're keeping track of microseconds. Um, you would have to have some abstraction layer 
uh, to go through and say, okay, this many clock cycles, or now it's this time, and now at a certain date and time, and then you're gonna uh, keep track of, from that point of view, from that time, how many seconds have gone by and increment your own uh, clock for the humans. Okay. Great. So first, um, this is the basic block diagram of a crystal oscillator. Um, there's not much more that the, you don't have to play with this that much. There's an inverter. There's this uh, resistor up top that helps control uh, how much current essentially is being in feedback. There's this crystal here. And then you might find that your block diagram or your crystal, or sorry, the STM32 requires some loading capacitors. Whatever the STM manual says to put on your PCB, you put it on. Don't, you, your job is not to reinterpret what those fine engineers at STM have figured out. If they say, put this crystal on there with those caps, specifically these values, even better if they give you a part number, just do it, okay? Um, certainly, as for, this is definitely for your first PCB you ever make. Usually, just somebody makes a PCB in this class, uh, and certainly in 473. Later on, if you, if you really get excited, you can work through all the dev notes and determine, determine your own crystal and your own uh, loading caps if you needed to. This is just fair warning, do whatever the data sheet says. Uh, there's lots of different types. The most common is um, these low frequency crystals, uh, 32.768 kilohertz, which turns out to be some multiple of seconds. So it became very common. I don't know what the multiplication factor is off the top of my head. We calculate that out, it becomes seconds, and then it's very easy to have something that's human face facing. Uh, you just update your time every so often. Um, but there's a huge variety of uh, crystals. Um, usually you import, you know, you connect them to some uh, module here. Um, and then this has that little driver circuit we talked about and maybe you need some external caps. There's other things called saw resonators. Uh, these are much higher frequencies. Yeah, all right. It's this. So there is digital cleanup. These these are not, there are things called oscillators that you could buy like on DigiKey that, that will give you, or external clocks that will give you square waves. These are not those things. Uh, this is, you know, a piece of quartz or some other material, and this circuit here will turn it into a square wave for you. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned earlier how we can pre-scale like a, a crystal oscillator for whatever frequency we want. Kind of, yeah. Oh my God, thank you for asking. I really appreciate it. Let's, let's talk about that. All right, um, so I mean, we will talk about that, but typically we won't start at uh, the crystal oscillator kilohertz to go all the way up to megahertz or gigahertz. That, that step is pretty far to go. But there are, there are lots of different frequencies that, if you go back here, uh, there's lots of different frequencies that you, oh, come on. Uh, this can, you can easily get up into like the hundreds, maybe 200 kilohertz range with crystals. Uh, you switch to MEM saw resonators. Um, the details are not that important. Uh, then you get up to 10 megahertz, up to 100 megahertz. There is this kind of unfortunate missing gap of around a megahertz where it's kind of hard to find crystal oscillator or any resonant structures. But if you look hard enough, you can find something. Uh, so anyways, now you can get something that would probably be more your clock frequencies. Uh, what's nice is these are very accurate, um, but still a limited number of frequencies. Uh, and usually they're looking in like parts per million, their deviation in parts per million, if not billions. And then you'd have a different port on your STM. So before the crystal oscillators went up in the low frequency oscillator uh, connection point, and these are in the uh, megahertz clock frequency detector uh, ports. Um, you also have a bunch of internal, yes. Um, why would you want one of these So uh, the low frequency stuff is good at uh, keeping track, so the 32.768 megahertz or kilohertz crystal is good at uh, keeping track of human time. That's really nice. There are also lower frequencies, usually lower in power. 
So now by using, having a clock that runs off that, you can put everything into sleep mode and you can have something that's battery powered that's gonna last longer than if you have clocks that are running at megahertz all the time. So it's usually a power or you just want a particular frequency for a particular reason. Sometimes you'll have, I don't know, uh, you'll have some sensor or something that needs to be pulled out of, or interface with a particular frequency and it's just easier just to find a clock and put it, have that, your whole system running off that clock frequency. So you may choose something that's non-standard. Um, your devices have internal uh, digitally controlled oscillators. These are less accurate, they're more agile, and basically these are a ring of inverters, an odd n number of inverters, and put into feedback, and so as you turn one high, then that high bit will ripple all the way through the inverter chain and come back to the beginning and then flip that over. So you have these, uh, a clock signal that works that way. It's just that the accuracy is dependent on the process parameters of those inverters, and so they usually have a little bit more jitter, or if you put a certain value in, you might not get exactly that clock frequency. The nice thing is, though, is by deciding where, which one of those inverter chains you tap allows you to uh, change the frequency agent, uh, quickly. You don't have to actually take a crystal off and put it back on. Uh, so that's beneficial, and that, that is something that you'll want to do uh, if you're some, doing something that's very power specific or maybe a protocol specific, you might want to uh, lower your clock frequencies because uh, you want to go into low power mode, you get a bit of data or something you have to do, you go into high power mode, or maybe you want to match some external peripheral. Uh, the, coming back to your question, the external clock uh, input is for the SCM32, only goes up to 48 megahertz which means that special circuit with the inverter and the resistor only really is rated up to 48 megahertz. But you guys may have noticed that your bus and your, um, uh, your APB bus and your a HB bus and your core all run around 120 megahertz. And so how do they get there? They have something called a PLL, so this is a phase lock loop. It allows you to use a source crystal or source oscillator and uh, multiply it up. And so the trick is you have something that's, you have an internal oscillator that's running, uh, DCO that's running much, much faster, uh, and then you're phase locking it so that every, how do you describe this? Uh, if you had a child on a swing and you pushed every single time, right, you're perfectly locked with them and then it's a one-to-one -one ratio. If I uh, go and push the child at night and I push three times in between, if I'm perfectly aligned, the third time I'll always push the child, even though my arms are going. So my arms are going three times faster than the child's coming over, and I get synchronized every time the child comes up. And if I get it wrong, right, then I'm pushing the wrong way, and my, was, my phase was off. So that kind of trick of looking at the edge of when a slower clock is coming and realigning their current edge to meet that timing is a way we can make faster clocks. Yeah, you're, you're saying that I'm gonna be some multiple of 48 megahertz. So I'm gonna go twice as fast, and I'm just gonna check every other time, every other clock cycle to make sure my phase is aligned. And if I'm going too fast, if the child, if I push before the child's there, then I'm gonna slow down a little bit. And if I push after the child was there, then I'm gonna speed up a little bit. So there's a little bit of error associated with it. It's not as stable as a pure crystal oscillator, but over time it can be very accurate. So yeah, there's error in, there could be error in any individual clock cycle, but over time, it's, it's, that's on average, yeah. So the phase lock, who counts for one half of each swing? Like, do we need a counter to uh, No, it's done in analog, or it's, sometimes it's done in, uh, with a digital circuit, but you as programmers don't have to, to deal with it. You just set up a bunch of rev registers. This is like a peripheral, and the hardware will take care of it. You just have to know that uh, the takeaway is a PLL is a way to boost the clock frequency up. That's the takeaway. Uh, let's see. You get multiple clock frequencies. You do get higher noise, higher power consumption. So there, there's trade-offs, trade-offs and everything. Um, we don't really go into clock distribution in this class, but it's good to be aware of it. Your labs are gonna have been asking you and will continue to ask you, set up some arbitrary registers to click, choose clock frequencies. 
It's just good to know that you have a bunch of clock sources here and you can route versions of those clock sources all over your chip to different areas. So if you had, say, uh, I don't know, you're trying to do VGA uh, videos or something, you're trying to drive a VGA uh, display that has very specific timing that's required. Your chip isn't set up for that. However, you could change your DCO to be about something that's correct and then route that signal or a version of that signal throughout your peripherals. You might say that I want my clock or my core to be exactly eight times whatever my peripheral clock is so I have time to do some computation before sending bits out to my peripheral bus, which must be at some clock frequency uh, defined by what it's connected to. Anyways, just another, this is all, these are all just warnings. Just be aware, clock trees and clock distribution is an option should you need it, okay? A lot of this class is getting into, uh, we've transitioned to a phase where I'm trying to make you aware of things so that when you try and solve classes of problems in your projects, you at least have a memory map of where to go to. Oh, if I have to change the clock frequency, I remember there was something about this, it's capable, I have to go look up in the manual to figure out that detail. Okay, so let's get to this block here. This is the block that we primarily care about now and then the low-level system drivers is how you will interface with this block, okay? So counter basics, you have some clock frequency coming in. The clock frequency probably originated as a crystal oscillator or a saw resonator or maybe a, a digitally controlled oscillator somewhere else on the chip, but now it's been routed to you, okay? It's been routed to this timer uh, module you get to use a prescaler to control or to down convert this clock to something, to multiply it by some value so you can make it slower if you want. Okay? That's an option if you want to, so if this thing's going at 120 megahertz and you want to uh, measure the passage of weeks, you may just not be able to, you might be going too fast to keep track of long periods of time. So this prescaler allows you to look at longer events, you'll see that in a bit, but maybe at different re at lower resolutions. Then you have a timer counter module. You have an option to send an interrupt and you have an option to reset that timer. So you can go into those more detail. Um, all right, yeah, your prescaler, this would be the, the equation for your prescaler. Um, this helps you say you have internal clock, you have some digital, you know, binary or uh, decimal value held in some register. So you can imagine your pre-sailor is gonna be at some memory address and you can go look up on the data sheet and say, I wanna set my pre-sailor to something and you would put some, usually it's a 16 bit value in there. The trick is for STM specifically is 16 plus one. Because if you pre-scale by zero, then you have no clock coming out and they don't wanna have that condition. So they mandate that you have a one. At least the pre-scaler has to be one, can't be zero. Um, let, me, let me go to the slide first. There is an inherent difference between clock dividers and prescalers. So some parts of your circuit diagrams will see clock dividers. Clock dividers are simply just D flip flops uh, where a clock comes in, it gets fed back to the next stage, it gets to the next stage, and then you have taps. So this is F divided by two, four, or eight. These are really simple modules that you'll find as options to configure all over your device. Um, this is often done through the cube ID GUI. You can click on what your prescaler values would be. This is different than a prescaler, sorry, clock divider values are. It's different than a prescaler which lets you divide by some 16 bit number, or 16 plus one number, yeah. Um, for the clock dividers, you are kind of limited to um, the two, four, eight, and 16. Yep, so they're simpler. Uh, prescalers actually have counters inside of them and all these other things to, to allow you to have uh, any multiple of the clock frequency. Um, however, these are much cheaper and easier to use in some ways. Uh, so you'll often find, uh, especially in your cube ID schematics, you know, you have little toggle buttons you can go and click to make easy clock divisions. But there is a conceptual difference between the two. Um, just to make it a little bit more crystal clear. You know how I like false set, I couldn't resist. Oh. 
So basically, oh, that's going way too fast. So here we have a clock coming in. Now it's going too slow. And basically this clock edge is just rippling through. Two clock edges, get one clock edge here. Four clock edges, one clock here. And you can see that down here. So we're dividing basically this incoming frequency by two, by four, by eight, by 16. So you guys uh, can go and if you really got excited, you can copy this link in there and play with it. Take a look how that works. Okay. So anyways, conceptually you need to know the difference between clock dividers and prescalers. All right. So we have two types of primary, primary types of timer modules. Uh, we have things that capture, uh, they're called capture timers, they measure how long something takes to pass. Um, and then the compare timers is uh, measuring how, how often something occurs, okay? So let's look at example one. Uh, and you will know this from the from your uh, uh, your homework assignments. To so say you have a span that's uh, fan that's spinning, and you want to know how fast it's spinning. If you had a GPO pin that was going up every time that went around, you could figure out how long it had gone uh, between rotations. And we just had you do it without the formation, of, like the formalism of what a timer mechanism mechanism is. All right. So let's look at the, the anatomy of this thing a little bit more. So um, I should have said this a little bit more clearly. A counter just literally counts up or down, depends how you configure it, but say in this case it counts up from zero up to some value. Um, and so these are usually 16-bit timers. Um, and so it's just gonna count every clock edge, it's gonna keep going up and up and up and up, okay? So, uh, you can count up quickly or you can count up slowly depending on your prescaler. And then you have this compare, uh, we're gonna have this capture compare time uh, register, so it's a CCR, we have it in compare mode. And basically, you would store some value in here. This is the thing you want to, to an alarm to go off. So say you put a thousand in here, when a thousand clock cycles have gone by, then this does something. And so what does it do? Well, usually it, it sends off an interrupt service routine. And now your processor has a way to say, okay, now it's time for me to do something. Does that make sense? I see, I see no. Yes. So what would be the, can you do the same kind of thing with the, um, the interrupt directly Oh, this, uh, this could be, a, sorry, you're right. This could be an interrupt when the timer goes all the way up to, say, uh, its largest value, FFFFF, right? Then you could have the thing go off. And you can, you could, um, yeah, there are different ways to do this. Actually, maybe I got this wrong. Capture and compare timer. Sorry, I described compare timers, let me describe capture timers. It's just the inverse. Here we have capture timers. You're saying I set up a timer that goes off. It's gonna count up until some value, is this gonna keep counting? And when some GPIO pin goes off, then I'm gonna say what was the value in this register when, uh, sorry, what was the value of that timer when the GPIO pin went high? And then we're gonna set off and interrupt. So in this particular case, it's uh, I wanna count how long until since somebody pressed a button until they press the button again. So first time they press it, you say, okay, timer, activate, go. And then you're waiting for the GPIO pin to go high. When it goes high, it says, okay, great. I'm gonna take the value from that. I'm gonna put it into here. I'm gonna capture it. And then I'm going to send off an ISR. So then you'd have a value in here that uh, was in there that happened when that person pressed that button. And now the, uh, you can keep track of that duration of time. Yeah. You don't have to reset it, it could just keep going. Why not? Just let it keep counting up. You still have a value here, right? GPIO went high, I copied the value of the timer into this register. I'm holding it here until you want it. I'm gonna tell you that you want it by setting up an ISR. 
And then you and your ISR could go, okay, what was that value in the timer? How long has it been since the person pressed the button? And you go in here, you pull that value out, and you say, aha, it's greater than this value or lower than this value, I should do this task. Um, you could, it doesn't have to be an ISR. I mean, you could just have something that's, you go and pull this register, and you say, is the value in here, it used to be zero, or whatever it is in reset, and now the value is some value, and you look for the change continuously, you don't have to use the ISR, it's just, that's usually the easiest way to do it. Um, for input captures, you can, there's a lot of flexibility as you look through your data sheets of how you want to uh, trigger this GPIO interrupt. So you can do rising edge, falling edge, there's all sorts of different um, options. You can look at just only the rising edge of signals. Okay? So lots of different ways you can configure that capture to occur. Um, this is another view of that. You have some clock coming into your time your counters, counting up or down, however you configured it. External edge comes in, you've detected the edge. So your edge detector, that detection process happens in the GPIO, if you have, you know, if you're using this for a GPIO input, look through that block diagram. Uh, when that basically, when it's an input and the input goes high, uh, one of the alternative functions is it will route that signal to your timer module, and now your timer module will be like, oh, I should do something. When this pin goes high, when I have edge triggered, positive edge, negative edge trigger, now I should do something, and you can take that value, you copy the value of this in the timer and put it in the uh, capture register, uh, so the core can get to it later. Okay, so let's, what's the example of this? This would be, um, you have a stopwatch. This is directly analogous to having a stopwatch. Somebody's running a race. You're obviously not gonna look at the stopwatch and try and figure out exactly when they cross the line and look at both at the same time. So when you see them cross the finish line, you press the button, it's stored on your stopwatch, then you can look at it whenever you want. That would be directly analogous to how this works. Either I'm perfectly clear or nobody understands what I'm talking about. Nobody understands what I'm talking about. Great. Yes. So say you are a race, you're monitoring a race, you say um, when the Thing goes off, you, you start your timer, right? So your clock's going by, you see the runners coming, they're gonna cross the finish line. Instead of trying to look at your clock going by and this at the same time, that would be too hard. You're just gonna keep your finger here. When they cross this finish line, you click a button, okay? And then uh, you can go and look back at that timer and show everybody, here's how long it elapsed from the start of the race to this time. If we look at this example, we can go back to the other diagram. If we look at this example, uh, the race started when this timer started, or when this counter started. The counter started at zero, zero. I send some command to it. It starts the race, okay? This thing starts counting up, just like my stopwatch starts going by, okay? The person crosses the finish line. That a GPO pin goes high. The value that's in the timer is captured and stored uh, in the uh, capture compare register. That's the same as me that happens when I press the button, right? Then that value is stored on my watch and then ISR goes off and then I can look at the watch and record that value. How's that feel? Yeah? How does our legal value set you work? Oh, then you're, then you're SOL and you're in trouble. Yep. Uh, you as a programmer can make all sorts of bad decisions. I do it all the time. Um, so there, we didn't quite get to this part, but the auto reload says, um, Basically, if you get, if your ISR goes off or you get to some value, then automatically you have the option to, you don't, it's not a requirement, you have the option of automatically restarting your timer. So say you want it to go up to 5,000 and then come back and start again, you can tell it to do that. So it's constantly going from zero up to 5,000 and restart, go up like that. You can have it just count up one time and stop. There's lots of different options. Well, earlier you said that when you enter an interrupt, it's basically like everything else in your processor's like in a loop doing like Right, so if you enter the interrupt, then how is your timer still counting? Uh, maybe let me go back one second. 
Uh, when I said that, I would think I was referring to the fact you could write an algorithm or a, a thing where you're basically sleeping all the time and your interrupts were doing everything. Um, the second part is, how does this do anything when my core is waiting? This is all in hardware. Yep. Your core is off here. This is a peripheral. Oh, hey, good questions. This is a peripheral. It's on the end of your APB bus. You're going to talk to this peripheral. You're going to write data into these registers, the CCR, and your time register uh, through the bus. And uh, your core is just waiting for interrupts to occur to respond to this thing. Good question. What other questions? Yeah. How do we set the CCR to be there versus first capture? It's a configuration register. Yep. OK. Here's, here's all those fun details. Um, so you have, this is for the input side. So you have um, your input comes in. You have some filtering um, possibilities. You can check to see if it's edge, which edge it is, positive or negative edge. You can prescale that input value. Basically, you could have a little mini counter that's going through and says, if the button is pressed four times, only when it's pressed four times, then pass it on to my capture compare timer. It's just giving you some flexibility. Um, let's see what else we have. We have different ways of setting interrupts, uh, uh, interrupt edge detection, over, uh, over capture flags, all these, oh, DMA requests, all sorts of different options in your uh, capture, input capture uh, chain. Yeah. So when you say button press, is that really when you're looking at like edges of signals? Typically, we look at edges of signals. So it's either there. It's, there's no, uh, in this world, you don't look at just a logical high or logical low because you want the immediacy. You're, you're trying to service this thing within one clock cycle, whatever clock is using it. And so edge goes high, and then usually a piece of hardware will capture that and say, OK, an edge has gone high. And you're trying to do that within one clock cycle. Um, how much time do we have? We have some time. Uh, so say you want to, um, another example here, of using a compare timer. You want to set, uh, you have variable C DC motor. Um, we haven't really talked about how DC motors work. Uh, typically, you don't drive DC motors by putting variable amounts of voltage or current through it. What you do is you turn them on for a certain period of time. 10, micro, 10 milliseconds, and then turn them off for a certain period of time. On average, you're getting a certain amount of current that will drive it at speed. So you want full blast, you put 100% uh, duty cycle in there. You want to go very slow, 1%. You want to go half speed, you go at 50%. So the timer allows you a way to control how long uh, a motor's on or off. And you do it very quickly. So if, you, if you're sending uh, this kind of square wave to a motor very slow, say in the order of seconds, you would see the motor go But if you do it fast, like in milliseconds, humans can't see it. We don't perceive it. In fact, the motor already has a bunch of mechanical momentum, right, because it's a spinning thing. So it kind of averages out. And then the, the, if you do it fast enough, the motor doesn't really notice that it's not really getting a variable current. It's just getting pulses of energy. Anyways, that's, how, that's why you would care about using a timer for a motor. Um, OK, so we're going to send it a duty cycle. So we need to generate, conceptually generate, a duty cycle with a certain frequency. Okay? So this is for a compare timer. So in this particular case, um, we, have a, we still have our clock that's coming in. We have a prescaler. And we'll have some examples later on where we talk about when to use a prescaler and, and what the value of that is. We'll make it a little bit more clear. But we have a counter that's going to be counting up to some value. And then we have a compare timer, which is comparing its internal value to something uh, on that timer. And when those two are equal, then we're going to do something. Okay. So, um, so say you're counting up to 1,000. When this thing equals 1,000, then you're going to have an ISR go off. Okay. In the particular case of the motor, you could say, I want you to be high for 1,000 clock cycles. Uh, and then when this ISR goes off, I'm going to go change the motor direction to, I'm going to put a zero out, and then it's going to go down to zero, and then I want to off for, say, 
uh, 500 cycles or something, and then that would be your duty cycle, how much time you're off versus how much time you're on. Now you can control the speed of the motor that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, it only does equals. I, I wonder what a greater than would be. I mean, it's always, it will go high yeah, greater than or equal to, I guess, that point of view. I, you, you, could go, you could have a time where I guess somehow going so fast, the clock could go so fast that this thing wouldn't react in one cycle and it would have to be the greater than or equals to. I don't think that would ever really happen. But yeah, it's gonna go off whenever this thing is equal to. And even if the timer keeps advancing, it'll, be, it'll still go off. I don't, think that, I, don't, I don't think that particular case could happen, but yes. Uh, okay, so to finish this off, there's lots of different ways in which you can uh, do this. You can, uh, there's a configuration register where you can say, if you're counting up and this equal, do this. If it's counting low, you can have it toggle back and forth between counting up and counting dough. You can always force it, the output to be high. You can force it to be zero or you can freeze the, uh, the timer itself. So there's just, a lot of little configuration registers that you can use, and it helps when you're trying to set up your PDMs, PWM signals. Um, so just to make it clear, this gives you the option of setting your counters. They can count up, hit some value, uh, reset to zero, and count up again. You could go counting down, uh, hit some value, reset up to high to some large value, and count down. And you can also set it up to count up, hit some value, and count down. There's a lot of ways, any just one of these would be fine. But you find out from a programming point of view and sometimes the signals you have to generate, it's nice to have this flexibility. So probably 90% of uh, conditions which you're gonna need to make a PWM or something will be capable with any one of these, but it's nice to have the flexibility and STM gives you that flexibility. All right. And I think we'll, we'll end on this slide. Um, this is just to, to point out that STM gives you the possibility of having multiple capture compare registers for individual timers. That depends on which timer it is. You have, I think, 17 different timers available on your silicon. There's a lot of things you might want to keep track of. This would be you want to keep track of the passage of time, how long somebody pushes a button. You also want to keep PWMs going out uh, to control motors and LEDs and servos. All these things need timers. Uh, it's kind of hard to have enough timers on a microcontroller. Uh, and you can, we'll talk about making virtual timers out of a timer later on in case you needed more and there's some trade-offs. But basically we're saying here is a 16-bit counter, it's counting up, and you could have multiple compare capture uh, registers on that. The thing is you just have to be responsible that one counting up, so you'd have to say that counting up from zero to some value works for all your capture compare needs. So there would have to be some coordination there. But this would be a way to go and have, say, f four different PWM impulses going out of your chip off of one timer. So a way to reuse your timers. Any questions? Perfectly clear. Fantastic. I think it will make more, more sense when you start working in lab, uh, and we'll do some more examples and worksheet stuff next week. I might present your slides for you. Now, 
I'll count that as making up for money. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to get back to my office. I can do it right now. Are scores already released? The scores have not been released. They'll be released today. I mean, I have my lab members over there. I have a lab yet. Is that the office or the time for the lab? You might not reveal that, but then you might lab members. Oh, no, it's great. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, uh, how 